I'm glad to be here today. I'm going to talk about one developer portal to document them all. It's a bit of a journey that we had um, as we were dealing with various clients and different API types that needed documenting and how, how this all worked out. So first about me, I'm really glad to be here. As we already talked about, I'm a solutions architect and also generally a loudmouth in the company. Um, you can contact me at my email address here and we'll put those into Slack, uh, into the chat if you want to, or on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to connect with anyone who wants to exchange further ideas. So the basic premise of the talk today is that APIs in a modern enterprise are very rarely uniform or all of the same type. Um, I think that's a given. We see this all the time when we talk to prospective clients or existing clients, and the reasons are manifold. The first reason is definitely organic growth. Uh, in a modern enterprise, um, you know, things happen. The various business units start um, something, and other business units start, start something different, and then you've got basically what we should call a mess. There are also mergers and acquisitions that bring in very different approaches to the same overall goal, which again, results in non-uniform and uh, a non-uniform API landscape. There are also specific technical needs. Uh, one business unit decides this is what we need and what the other guys are doing is not satisfying the requirements are we'll do it our own way. And there are miscellaneous other reasons that we are not fully aware of because we typically don't come in at the decision process. But the fact remains that in a large modern enterprise, you rarely look at all the same APIs of all the same type. And then the question is, how do we get this documented properly and simplify the developer journey that Josef talked so well about? So your result is this, you've got REST APIs with their specifications, you've got async APIs with their specification, you've got possibly older SOAP APIs with their whistle specification, you may have GraphQL with the documentation around it, and you may have gRPC or other protocol buffer uh, based APIs with their documentation and possibly other stuff, but these are the five big ones in today's landscape. And really, what you want to get at is have this all in, a in one developer portal, get it rendered properly and have additional documentation for each API type and, uh, and have it sort of uniform so that in the middle we have the developer uh, as a, with a happy face, right? Back to Joseph's doc. It's, it's all about the developer journey and the developer satisfaction. Are they finding what they need? Can they be successful? Are they sticking with you? That's really the big goal. So we're looking for that magical tool where one item can rule them all. So, or in, in, to put it into words, once a company decides to fully manage and document their APIs, to put emphasis on an API first strategy and really streamline all of their digital governance, then they start looking for the developer portal that can support their needs and, and really document all the artifacts that they have. And it may not just be APIs, it may also be other developer artifacts that they want to bring to the fore. So what we're looking at today is a few examples of what we have been able to do and, and maybe a few takeaways of what is possible in, in other tooling, not just ours. We're starting with the simplest, with REST. We all know REST APIs. Um, we are using Swagger UI. We saw that also in Joseph's talk. Um, what's specific about our solution is that we theme the Swagger UI so that it actually fits the brand guidelines. So in our demo, which is you see on the screen here, it has our demo colors. In, in another implementation, it would look native. So we make it visually a little more appealing. Um, what you also see, is all the other tabs we have here um, on this reference documentation and a quick look at what that is. Um, 
we, we provide landing pages where you can have descriptions, business value of the API uh, to facilitate the uptake, the evaluation step. Is this for me? You can have tutorials that go deeper. The point here is that um, we realized years ago that a developer doesn't just need the documentation or if you look at it from, from a product owner perspective, there's more to the API story than the reference documentation. There is a whole lot more very often and there need to be containers that contain the rest of the story, whether that's tutorials or business description or anything else that's up to the, uh, the product owner to decide, but you need to facilitate full you need to be able to facilitate full information that lives closely together so that um, anybody who engages with your APIs or technical affordances to get started quickly. So when we talk about async API, again, we have a specification. Um, the really useful stuff here is that the async API landscape is much more modern and they, in their tooling, they have a way to output Markdown. And as we all know, as tech writers uh, or the tech writers among us, Markdown is sort of the lingua franca. And if your developer portal can take on Markdown, then you're almost home free. So here we see the streetlights sample that you see in the async API space as one of the, the sample items. And just putting the Markdown into a developer portal here it's slightly differently themed with a more of a black and white theme but it's it, it it's there if i scroll down you see this here it, it looks native it's uh, it, it's it's lo looks like it belongs here it, it can live right alongside with your rest apis in the same developer portal and the the developers who uh, are familiar with async APIs will find all the information that they need because it's a standard output of their docs. And of course, we still have the, the tabs on the side for further documentation. So that one was an easy win when we were faced with documenting this. GraphQL is sort of a different beast. Um, I'm, what we generally do is that we put the GraphQL Playground JavaScript library into the developer portal. You see here a quick example. I'm part of a meetup that meets every month. I make it about every other month or so uh, of a bunch of GraphQL-centered people. And the consensus still is give people the GraphQL Playground. That's the tool they know. Then they can explore the GraphQL API on their own because it's self-documenting, this is generally regarded as a best practice. So the solution here is um, embedding the uh, playground JavaScript. SOAP is a very different beast. Uh, here we have an example of a very bespoke documentation that we ended up building. Um, this customer requested to have what you see here on the page, it looks fairly dry. I'm not sure this is a good solution, but it's what this customer wanted. What's also possible, of course, in the SOAP world is um, we use Drupal as, as a base system. There is a module for SOAP APIs called WhistleDoc that my friends uh, Alex Borsotti and Kristin Brenner wrote and maintain that could also live here. Um, again, we in our case, we, we have the tooling. In, in any other dot developer portal solution that may not easily be there. So because SOAP is, is a very opinionated API, that may just require bespoke solutions, but it can live in a developer portal with a bit of effort. And the proof is, is here. This particular client has their SOAP uh, API documentation live on their site. Unfortunately, I'm not able to name names here but let's just assume it's, it's there, it works. Then gRPC, uh, that's again a different beast, but um, gRPC is, is, is a much more modern API type and um, it comes out of the asynchronous world. Um, it's based on protocol buffers. And 
the, the really interesting thing there is that the Proto C compiler that's used as tooling within uh, to actually set up and, and, and uh, the entire protocol buffers um, has a documentation plugin. And once you've got that in play, based on, on the technical specification, it will output markdown which makes it a very easy win again, because if you can ingest Markdown, then you've got it in your uh, developer portal um, as we have in ours, and you see that here. Um, for anybody who does work with gRPC, this looks familiar. This is what exactly what they expect. Um, and then you know, you're home free. So basically the lesson is if you can output Markdown from the tooling, uh, then that's what you will ingest into the developer portal and put there along with uh, an ancillary documentation like tutorials and other items. And everything else, of course, there's a lot more in the API landscape that is in use and more are added every year. Um, the API landscape does maybe not move as fast as, as the JavaScript uh, developers move theirs, but it still is in constant flux. But the good news is that most modern API ecosystems have tooling to output Markdown, as I mentioned multiple times in this talk. And so if you can output Markdown in the tooling, then input into any developer portal is fairly straightforward these days. So you have it in there. It may re require a few additional touches to look really nice, but you're basically there and you can ingest it and you can have it all side by side regardless of what the technicalities are of the API. It is possible to get it all in there. So our conclusion uh, is that despite a large variety of API types and protocols that can and should be documented, uh, it can be in a single cohesive developer portal in a straightforward and visually appealing way um, so that you can present to your developers what they need to be successful regardless of the variety and, and discrepancy that you have behind the scenes. And so as sort of a snarky conclusion, I'll leave you with this as a complexity. What complexity? And thank you for listening and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't know if uh, from the audience, you know, uh, but um, Tom Johnson has a series on his blog, uh, I'd rather be writing about trends that are to be followed or to be forgotten. And uh, one of the last trends from this summer, it's a two piece at this point, I think, um, is about whether developer portals um, are a door to the complexity and whether technical writers should pay a lot of attention now to complexity before it's too late. And whether um, what we see as phenomenon recently that um, people have a T-shaped knowledge as in a, a, a not too deep horizontally broad understanding and then a, a narrower part, a very deep and thorough understanding and whether there is place for technical writers who approach the full broad landscape from a complexity lens so uh, this is not really a question, it's just putting it out there. If uh, the, the last comment from Chris um, got your attention, um, uh, we also had a uh, last spring, this is why we didn't have API to docs last spring, because we got into complexity land. Uh, I think Mark is here in the audience. Uh, we got into complexity land about, okay, developer portals and complexity, what is complex, what isn't. What is the um, I will ask this one question before uh, Irona's question. Um, what is the question that clients with a complex API set wish they asked earlier? I'm not sure we even know. Um, they generally don't tell us after the fact. Um, we, we normally hear very early on and says, okay, so this is us and 
we don't just have REST APIs, we also have other stuff. Can you handle this? This is a question that comes up very early, which is very fortunate because we, by now, since we've done it all, we can say, yes, just bring it on, we'll deal with it, and we'll figure it out together. Um, maybe the deeper question is, if they have the diversity landscape, should they simplify? Should they go back and refactor some of this into more cohesive APIs? You know, should, I mean, a simple solution is you put a gateway in front of it and you proxy things. And then all become everything becomes a REST API, but that's maybe not a good idea with say as async APIs or or gRPC, um, because now you put complexity and and also a whole lot of delays in front of it, which makes me as an architect and and performance nerd very unhappy. So the bigger question is: Are these clients? clear about what they want to do internally and and why and is it are, are there are those good decisions we we certainly don't have the answers to this but we can at least help facilitate those discussions mm -hmm. the sites that you were sharing on your slides are they uh public uh publicly accessible they except for one they all are um, unfortunately for most of our customers, I'm not allowed to name names, but they're mm -hmm. out in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, the, the GraphQL playground is in a proof of concept we built for a uh, infrastructure client. So that one is not, but uh, otherwise, yes, it's, out, it's all out in the wild. Mm -hmm. Ilona was asking, when you say input as a noun, do you mean document, code, graphics, any site elements? For me, it's it's uh, input in terms of the, that the documentation can end up, uh, the technical reference documentation can end up as markdown, and that's the input into the developer portal. So that's that for me, that is the crucial point. Can you produce markdown from your reference documentation? If yes, then I know we, we have a very easy solution. And I'm sure most of the other offerings do too. And then we can, you know, the rest of the input, of course, as uh, rightfully asked, is, is there are there are images, there are code samples, and everything else that needs to go alongside. But the fundamental question is: is can the re the, the technical scaffolding result in markdown output for reference documentation? Mm -hmm. That one needs to be resolved first. Claudio is asking, um, APIs can be used from almost any programming language. So how do you handle providing examples that satisfy the widest programming audience? Is it worth having examples for every language? I think so, yes. It's actually a question that comes up with a lot of customers that we talk to. Um, in our product, we happen to have um, a, a wide variety of languages available that can generate machine generated code samples, but we're also able to ingest um, code samples that come in with uh, API specification, at least for REST. With others, it's a little bit more varied, but um, all doable. Mm -hmm. And I think, I yes, multiple languages are important. Not everybody works in the same language. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, as one customer of ours put it, meet the developer where they are is there maxim and i very much agree with that sentiment mm -hmm. from jose uh, on your site do you have cases of developers that use more than one api or each api has its own separate set of developers i don't know because they're customers of ours i don't really know how their developers use it i'm guessing that ultimately for a functional application that uses needs data you need to talk to multiple apis um, and integrate them all and they may be of different types so you as a developer you may be uh, needing to teach yourself multiple somewhat related skills like, mm -hmm. how do I interact with a, with a REST API? How do I interact with an ASIC API? Because that's what's being offered to get me the data that I need. 
Um, the bigger question for me is, as as the owner of the APIs, do we want to bundle some of those items into products so that it becomes easier to consume it all? Um, and what should those bundles be? And should we be flexible with those bundles? That's strategic about your API governance and how you position yourself in the market. Mm -hmm. And Jose was asking another question from you. Do you try to make the different APIs documentation consistent in tone, structure, and so forth? Or each API documentation has its own needs, so that wouldn't really make sense? I would say from a developer perspective, it makes sense to make it consistent. That task is largely up to our customers. We give them the tooling to be able to make it as consistent as possible, and we can help with uh, with with the theming and the, the presentation layer um, but how they do un unless they engage us also for tech writing this is largely up to them i think it's desirable but it's also possible that uh, the individual apis are different and in need a somewhat different presentation for that reason um, we recently did a survey of how much our customers are using of our ability to have those tabs alongside with uh, the reference documentation. The record stands at 11 tabs, but that customer typically also only uses three, but they had that one special API that just needed a lot of additional documentation around it. And so they overloaded our facility. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing they had a very good reason for that. Mm -hmm. From Claudio, um, it's an interesting question. Video seems to be the default documentation media for the younger generation, but it seems very absent from API documentation. Do you think that's deliberate? Or we just didn't catch up yet? <laughs> I don't really know. Um, I mean, we're watching the landscape and we're reacting to it largely as, as a company that offers services around developer portals um it generally doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to be proactive so i i can't really answer your question in detail mm -hmm. um for for those product owners out there uh, that become our customers or maybe go with someone else i think that's a very important question for them to figure out you know where where they, do they need to position themselves to be successful and what do they go with Yes. Um, as a recent host to podcasts, I feel this dilemma in a different way because I'm an editor of a blog also. And to keep non-text material searchable and explorable, um, I think we're not fully there yet. Uh, either the tools uh, are not available or we don't know how to use them well enough, but it's the consumption and the editorial is not in sync yet, I think, in this uh, non-text media. But it will come. We don't know. I'm curious to see what's going to come. Um, Prashnath is asking you, if client SDKs are still popular, how critical is it for an API producer to supply SDKs in multiple languages, given most tools allow generation based on a spec? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And generally, the, our discussions with customers start of, can you host SDKs? Uh, to which the answer, of course, is yes. And then they look at what's possible to actually generate code from, from the spec and or include handwritten code snippets in the specification and display those. And at that point, very often the discussion drops and says, you know what, we'll probably uh, wait with our SDKs and see how far the, the machine generated code and and or hand generated gets us um so i think the larger sdks are by and large on the way out or at least play second role because the smaller snippets are more useful uh, for a developer because they're, they're almost certainly going to take just parts of the sdk uh, for themselves mm -hmm. peter is asking whether Markdown isn't actually pretty awful for code samples in API reference docs. 
<laughs> you'd have to ask a, pes- a tech writer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's not all that great. What we end up doing is uh, on the presentation layer, uh, we, we put a lot of tooling on top of code samples so that you get the code highlighting and uh, things. So they're, they're on, on output, we put classes on the output and then have libraries that do code highlighting. Um, so we're not just uh, putting the markdown per se. Yeah, on its own, just naked, no, no good, for sure. Mm-hmm. Sylvia is asking, how do you pull it all together with references between the outputs of the different tools under the same look and feel? Um, the benefit is that we we ingest Markdown and then we output HTML and that comes out looking fairly similar already. Uh, a bit of theming tweaks to make it more cohesive after you've got it in is really the way we go. So basically get stuff on page first, see you know how, how much it matches and whether how much we want to touch up to keep the look and feel cohesive enough. I mean, obviously, as you've seen in the examples, um, Swagger UI looks very different from what a protocol buffer specification outputs. But it's also what those practitioners expect each. So uh, it, it's largely about branding and you know getting the correct fonts in the right place and a bit of touch up visually. Mm-hmm. Uh, Prashnat, I uh, was asking uh, if you have suggestions on tools for generating markdown docs. Well, the fortunate situation is that for async APIs and gRPC or the protocol buffer space at large is that those tool sets already produce natively markdown as output. So we don't really need to go with other tooling. It's it's there as the standard. So if you look into what those ecosystems have, it's it's the, the, the thing that jumps out at you. So that's a very fortunate situation. For others, I would expect, especially for the newer stuff, that this is a pattern that we will see repeated um, so that we don't need to hunt down tools. If you've got really exotic things like homegrown APIs or so, um, that's a different beast. And that's largely to the team that built that. And, and you know, what can they do? Can they produce something where you can then put a, a markdown generator on top or can they integrate anything? I, we normally push this over to the customer. Can you get your tooling to the point where markdown is the output? If so, then then that's easy, or at least some other structured input format. Mm-hmm. I can add to that, to Prashna, that uh, if you go to api.docs.org um, through the menu system, uh, you get to uh, past presentations. If you are looking for specific tool recommendations and, and uh, some experienced narrative with those, um, also, the uh, Write the Docs community uh, is the most helpful place to ask uh, up-to-date, um, opinionated answers <laughs> on the tooling. And uh, a bit of tongue-in-cheek question from Dimitri. <laughs> What's your favorite SSG and why? My favorite? Um, SSG. <laughs> My, my question back is, what is SSG? And there was one more remark about curl, but I think that wasn't a question. Christoph, um, what is the thing as a solutions architect that people don't generally ask you, but you wish they would? Um, the, the really useful thing would be, are the requirements as we wrote them or supplied them, uh, helping you to, to come up with good solutions or do you need them differently or, or do we need further discussions? I generally have to go back, uh, and ask deeper questions, which of course is normal for an engagement, but, um, if we had, uh, back and forth right from the beginning of are, are our requirements uh, clear enough or do you need anything else? 
many cloud customers actually ask that, um, but some do not and simply expect that we fully understand and, and go with it. And then uh, invariably we end up in a back and forth. Um, also, we often talk to customers that are very early in their journey. And, you know, and if you look at, at Christoph's maturity map, they, they're sort of low on that. And then the requirements they have and the questions they ask are fairly broad and very unfocused. And that makes it really hard to come up with good solutions. So it's not really about the questions, but can we help them quickly evolve and, and get more focused about their own vision and roadmap so that we can give them solutions that, that help as, as opposed to just generic answers. So it's, can we mature together in some ways? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you.